Good morning, Willow Grove Bible Church, and good morning to um, a few who are already checking in on Facebook Live. We're glad that you're joining us. We have uh, worship today um, kind of led around the idea of unity, and uh, Brian Ruby is preaching on that subject. And I'd like to open up with Psalm, part of Psalm 61. It says, Hear my cry, O Lord, listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. I long to dwell in your tent forever and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. For you have heard my vows, O oh God. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Let's worship together. Turn, turn. i 
want to hear this song from the beginning one more time because it's their favorite song. So let's go for it and sing How Great Is Our God one more time. And this is just for you, Debbie. sing about how great our God is.
morning. Hello, friends. It's good to see you all this morning, and uh, it's a blessing to be here together. Um, just that song even reminds me of, you know, make us one, make us pure, make, have us love. All of it being done together, just a reminder that we are a body, and it is by our love for one another that the world will know who the Lord is, and and we're called to love one another as Christ has loved us, so pretty powerful. And uh, yeah, may we use this opportunity for that too. So I want to hear how God is working in your lives and um, what we can praise God for, thank him for, and how we can pray for each other, lift, lift each other up this morning. I guess I can share something with, uh, something funny happened at work with my dad and I. And, uh, it's really sweet. I mean, he comes in an hour after me every day, so he walks by my area and says, blessings to you, and I tell him blessings back, and it's, it's a nice way to start the day, but the one day, um, usually if someone's talking to me, he'll kind of, you know, mouth it, then I'll go to him later once I'm done with the person, but one day he came around to say blessings, and one of our coworkers was there, and, uh, you know, my dad said, I'm, I'm glad he did, but he decided to say blessings out loud anyway. And our coworker Eric said, "Where's my blessing?" And I'm like, "It's kind of like, wait, what?" <laughs> it, it was just like one of those little funny moments that you weren't expecting someone like Eric to just go, "Hey, wait, where's my blessing?" And of course, Dad said, "You know, oh, bless you too, Eric." And it was all jovial and fun. I just was not expecting that at all so it, it's hard to see even if it's a small small amount of growth or change but you know we have a presence there with jesus so please pray that it continues amen karen um i i won't lose time with being at work i guess a lot you know i work at grocery stores and so i come in contact quite a bit with a couple of couples, and um, sometimes you get into conversation with the customers, and uh, there was a couple people that were talking to me that came through my line about the pandemic and about the, the, the condition of the world in general. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I just feel myself saying, well, you know, I try to keep my eyes on the Lord and God. And then I'm not afraid, you know, whatever happens, it's in his hands. And a couple of people just said, yeah, we have to keep praying that God will keep it up. Just even a couple of people that said that, because they want to do is pray, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's the truth. Yeah. Keep your body on him. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. 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 Meg? Jeremiah posted recently, um, he was really quite amazing. Uh, he is on the fifth floor of Mass Rehab. And there was a shooting on the street. And a bullet went into the ceiling of the room next to him. But his room was fine. But I just, you know, it just 
Tatiana. Okay. Yeah, I think we probably all have kind of that struggle of trying to balance uh, different perspectives and what it means to be careful. I had the same conversation yesterday with my sister who's out in Seattle and is worried for my parents. And so, yeah. I just want to thank God for the fall that we've had. I was just talking to Karen about this, but I feel like, uh, like she was saying, God takes a paintbrush and paints the beauty all around us, and uh, sometimes we just drive right by it. Sometimes, you know, we just, I know it took my breath away a couple mornings driving to work, just incredible color, the beauty of it, reminding me of who he is, and uh, he's an artist, and he, he loves beauty, and he is beautiful, and we worship a God who, who does that. He is beautiful, and he, he shares that with us. I, I'm just amazed. I've seen some sunsets the same way. This is awesome. So I thank God for that. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we come to you once again here in this space this morning together. Um, Lord, all individually uh, unique and yet one in you for the sacrifice you've made, Lord, that we can be called your children, come before your throne, and uh, have this time this morning together as a body, as a family. And Lord, we just praise you and thank you for that. Thank you for your love for us, your care, for being our Father. Lord, we thank you for those who are not with us this morning in person, but uh, are, are with us online, um, that we can uh, be one with them even, as you are with them. Lord, thank you for the testimonies of work, as uh, Brian shared, as Karen said. Lord, we go to work, we see people we don't know, or maybe just colleagues we know uh, not very well, but regardless, we we want to be a light. And Lord, just the smallest words we are willing to and uh, boldly share uh, are seeds. And I just thank you for that. Thank you for uh, using us. And I pray that we would be more readily available every day as you put us in these situations to, to speak life into the, the world around us, the unique places each one of us goes to and is in. Or that we would shine like the stars in the universe uh, to honor you and that people would be drawn to that light. Lord, um, we, we pray for those who are affected by COVID, my aunt and uncle. I pray that you would give them peace and comfort. I pray for healing, Lord, that you know the timing of uh, everything. And I just pray they would know, uh, they do know you, and I thank you for that. I, I pray that they would know you're, they're in your hands. And you love them and care for them dearly. And uh, your comfort for the whole family as they go through this. We pray for your healing, Lord, that um, you would give their bodies strength to overcome this. Lord, we thank you for your protection over Jeremiah. And just the reminder of uh, the world we live in is evil. And, uh, and yet you are uh, with us and protecting us. And you are greater. Uh, than any power in this world, and we, we thank you that we are under your wings. Lord, um, I lift up this friend of David's, uh, Tatiana, and her daughter now left to move on without their, her husband and the father. And uh, we pray for your grace to be poured out, Lord, on them, your mercy, uh, the pain of, of moving on. I just pray that you would be their peace and comfort. I pray they would know that you are, uh, you are the God that heals. Uh, and I, I pray that they would know you through all of this. And uh, we also lift up Sarah and her mom and the situation with the estate. Lord, for 
those details and now that it's more complicated with COVID and trying to get practical things done, I just pray for your grace there to, uh, for the right people to get the right papers in the right hands at the right time, um, that you would help her with it. And I, I pray there wouldn't be frustration, but that you would help sort the whole thing out. And Lord, I also, um, again, pray for uh, Chris, his sister Claire, and for my sister and many others, Lord. We're not um, quite sure always how to, how, how to be careful, and it is a struggle, and it, there are differences of opinion. But Lord, again, I just pray for unity, and when we try to, uh, try to communicate that to others, I pray that they would know that we care, um, that we want to be careful. We... We uh, want to do what's right. So we ask for your wisdom in communicating that and showing that through our actions. And uh, yeah, thank you that you're in charge, you're in control. And uh, that's why we're here this morning, Lord, for your glory and honor. And we commit the time and this hour to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Right before the sermon, I just wanted to let you know that normally I don't pick songs by the Judds to uh, sing for worship. But um, the Lord has been really talking to me about how we can, in this time of division, even within our own families, either politically, faith-wise, or whatever, to come together and um, actually have a decent Thanksgiving meal together, because that could be kind of tough if you don't agree with what your, your, uh, either your husband or wife or friends have voted and all that kind of stuff. And this song points out what's really most important, that love can build bridges where nothing else can. And it's my prayer that we would have this same um, selfless love um, rather than pushing our own way. You know, love is not self-seeking, it's not boastful, all that kind of stuff. And to um, be willing to humble ourselves and um, build a bridge of love with people that either we don't understand or we understand and don't like, or, um, or worse. And pray that um, we would love our enemies and build bridges.
There we go. Oh. Now, I, now I know why Jason wears t-shirts. Goodness gracious. I'm sure that's the reason. <laughs> so before I begin, some of you may not recognize me because I'm not who I normally look like. Now you can all recognize me. Oh no. Yeah, I had to shave a few weeks ago, so there you go. Now you can all recognize me and relax. Oh. Never mind. <laughs> and that was worth it. Good morning, everyone. First, I want to thank you all for affording me this opportunity to speak to you guys this morning. It is truly an honor to be able to address you guys this morning. Today, we are going to start off with reading two passages. First, turn to your Bible to John 17, starting at verse 20. Jump in when you can. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. 
and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them, and I will continue to make you known in order that the Lord you have, that the love you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. Then the second passage will be in Acts 2, starting with verse 42. Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This morning, I want to explore unity with you. What does Jesus say about unity? What does the Bible say about unity? And what does it look like today? And what should it look like today? Honestly, I've been feeling pretty disjointed in most areas of my life. I mean, the one definition I saw that was great was lacking coherence or orderly sequence. Thankfully, I have been feeling pretty great at home with Ashley and our family members. I can't imagine where I'd be without that, and this is why we need to speak about unity, because not everyone has that support at home. Where they should be able to actually expect to find this unity is church. These past six months have definitely been deeply affecting all of us, especially the church. It is not just the pandemic which physically separated us for some time. Many aspects of our culture allowed disunity to ran, run rampant in the capital C church. We often forget how simple and powerful unity is. It shares the message of the gospel and reveals the love of Jesus to those who have not experienced it for themselves. There is a reason why Jesus calls us to love one another. There is a reason why he says that people will come to know him through us, by our love for each other. We are not meant to do this Christian life alone. We need fellow believers around us to help manifest the love of Jesus to build our faith in his love. Of course we can experience the love of Jesus when he speaks to us alone, but how many of us need to hear words of love and faith spoken to us by Jesus through one another? So John seventeen twenty three again says, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Yeah. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. It does not get much simpler than that. Jesus' desire was for people to come to know him through us because of our unity. I found this quote from an enduring word commentary. Jesus again referred to the living, organic unity he prayed would exist among his people. This isn't the totalitarian unity of coercion or fear, and it isn't the unity of compromise. Jesus prayed for unity of love and common identity in him. The idea that the unity of God's people specifically would display to the world that Jesus was truly sent from God, the Father, was so important to Jesus that he repeated it in the same short prayer. It is interesting to me that Jesus does not specifically speak about unity too much. He does mention it a few times, but I think the point we have to understand is that the life of Jesus and the lessons he taught us were intended to bring about the goal of a unified church. The quote continues, Then Jesus expanded the idea, now praying that the unity among generations of believers to come would also demonstrate to the world that Jesus loves his people and loves them after the pattern of God the Father's love for God the Son. This reminds us of the importance of unity and love among Christians. It is as if Jesus gave the world permission to doubt both his mission and his love, if the world does not see unity and love among the believers. This is difficult because sometimes the most unloving and critical among the followers of Jesus directly justify their divisiveness and sharp criticism as love, as in, I only demand that you be exactly as I am because I love you. 
Another beautiful quote I found from a Matthew Henry commentary is, the more they dispute about lesser things, the more they throw doubts upon Christianity. Let us endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, praying that all believers may be more and more united in one mind and one judgment. Thus shall we convince the world of the truth and excellence of our religion and find more sweet communion with God and his saints. Jesus wants unity with us just as he and the Father are one. What does this mean? What does Jesus mean when he says that he and the Father are one? There is a simple answer for this. The will of Jesus is ours too. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Jesus submitted his will to God before he went to the cross. That's what unity between he and the Father is. And what does Jesus instruct us to do? Matthew 16, 24 says, Then Jesus told the disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In Matthew 12, Jesus mentions that any house and kingdom divided against itself will not stand. Unfortunately, it feels like the house of God is currently very divided. There are many reasons why the house of God is divided right now, whether it's views and opinions on culture, politics, and even race. It is crazy to me that some churches still struggle with that. That blows my mind. While pondering the different aspects that are dividing the church, I feel similar to Jesus when he was casting his woes upon the scribes and Pharisees. The similarities between the seven woes and the current condition of the church is another message for another time. By the way, I don't want to confuse anyone, so if I mention church, I'm specifically referring to the capital C, big church. If I mean this church, don't worry, I'll specifically mention this one. If, okay. I will speak more on this in a minute, but pride and arrogance is running rampant throughout the fellowship of believers. Nothing is as great of a destroyer of unity as is pride, arrogance, and selfish ambition. What is our highest calling? What is our single binding aspect? The gospel of Jesus. Anything we say or do should be run through that filter. Here's a really good litmus test for something that has the potential to cause unity or disunity. Does it point to the gospel of Jesus and bring glory to Jesus? That's it, that's the question. We do not want to use biblical prophecies or precedents that do not apply to us, even if they feel good. A lot of people in the church are guilty of doing this, and most of the time it is directly contradictory to the gospel of Jesus. Even so, some of these, in prophecy, some of these prophecies and precedents may be important for the church today to see what God is doing, but how often are they spoken of in love? Especially to people who might turn away from the gospel, hardly at all. I'm going to stop myself right now before I go off on a tangent, because I could... It is pretty easy to see that Jesus obviously cares a great deal about unity. We should all seek to humble ourselves and seek the unity that brings people to Jesus. Unity begins with humility. It begins with denying oneself so that the will of God can become our own. So often we find examples in the Bible of people not denying themselves, which can create seeds of dissension and division. However, and more importantly, we can see the opposite. So often people point to the early church in Acts as the prime example for sharing the gospel and how we believe the church should be operating today. Why were they so unified? Because they were of the same accord, a single binding aspect, the gospel of Jesus. That was their calling and that was their guiding factor for every decision they made. A few months ago, I was on a two week active duty mission with my unit. Obviously this year we really did not do anything except for one tiny small performance. It turned out to be a great time to train at a time when we usually don't have a lot of time to train. A lot of our training was devoted to rehearsing for drill band for military ceremonies and parades. The reason we have to practice that is because it is actually a fairly tough thing to accomplish. To have 28 people play music in time, make sure we are all in tune, march at the same 26-inch pace and stride, perform precision movements, 
and keep the same distance between us. We are all constantly multitasking to make sure we are doing all these all at the same time. During one drill band rehearsal, I was thinking about all the people in my unit. Thankfully, we, had, we all get along with one another, one another in and out of uniform. We all hang out with each, each other and enjoy each other's company. We are also a fairly diverse unit. We have men, women, African-American, white, Chinese, Korean, Spanish, Puerto Rican. We have a lot. However, we all have a single binding aspect. When we are in uniform, we are soldiers. You know, we bleed green. We all wear the same clothes down to the socks. Although we still maintain our individuality and celebrate that, we first and foremost ascribe to the unity that the uniform calls for as soon as we put it on. When we call ourselves Christians, we are expected to put on our uniform and ascribe to the unity that we see in the life of Jesus and in his word. Philippians 2, 1 through 4 says, Therefore, if any of you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Our goal is to look like a single entity moving and operating as one. We all have to step on time and make our rows and columns perfectly straight. We are operating as a single entity. Romans 12, 4 through 5 says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. We have to remember that we are one body first. If we think of ourselves first as many parts instead of one body first, we end up looking like a Mr. Potato Head doll with the feet where the ears should be and the mouth where the eyes should be. We are first called to one body, which points to a coherent system where everyone knows the job and their place with the same goal in mind, to make the body work the way it should. When one part is not doing their job, the rest of the body suffers and ceases to, fu ceases to function in the way it was intended to work. Have you ever tried to bake a cake with just flour? Or even worse, just eggs? It's not gonna work. <laughs> this brings up my next point, the need for diversity. We cannot have unity in the church without diversity. Revelation 7, 9 says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. I'm really excited about what that's going to look like in thousands of languages and thousands of worship traditions. It's going to look awesome. Unity without diversity is just uniformity. And you know what? Some uniformity is okay. We actually do need that single binding aspect, the gospel of Jesus. What we do not need uniformity in is how we worship. There is a reason why the Bible mentions one body, many parts, and all nations coming to worship Jesus. It would be wrong of us to expect everyone to worship Jesus the same exact way. All of us will be shouting, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb in heaven, but not everyone will be speaking the Queen's English as we say it. All languages will be giving glory to God. Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Having unity calls for a single purpose so that we may all be in one accord. And again, what is our purpose? Sharing and living the gospel. The good news of Jesus, that he has come to die for our sins and to make us one with the Father again, so that we may be with him for all eternity. That's it. That's the purpose. There are no asterisks. There are no caveats. Nothing. That's it. 
When I think about who the disciples were, I think about how they all came from different walks of life. For example, fishermen and tax collectors were represented among the group. I mean, there was already some sort of cultural issue between those two. We do not know the specific disciples felt about each other. We don't know how they felt about each other. But we culturally know that tax collectors were often pretty negatively viewed. I am certainly not implying that there is any tension between the disciples because of this. But what we can see is how powerful Jesus' call is. It takes people from all walks of life and brings them to a place of comfort, safety, peace, and unity. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6 says, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all and in all. It is obviously tr not true that we all need to be the exact same carbon copy of each other. Instead, the Bible calls us to be like-minded. And what was that checklist again? Do nothing out of selfish ambition, value others among yourself, above yourselves, and not looking to your own interests. It is interesting to me that the same concept is essentially listed three times. No selfish ambition, valuing others above yourselves, and looking to the interests of others. The Bible calls us to die to ourselves, right? We put ourselves before Jesus, and he transforms our mind. Sometimes we struggle with that. We are often tempted to entertain thoughts that can cause division. Can I honestly ask how many of us often look at someone, and the first thought we have is not, that person is loved by Jesus. I definitely know I struggle with that. I often compare myself to them in a good or bad way. I think about how wrong a certain belief is that they may have or how right I am instead. Most of the time, the differences I see between the thoughts I have and the thoughts I have of someone else are unnecessary, completely unnecessary and cause division. When I say it is unnecessary, I mean it does not come again, up against the gospel of Jesus. So often we pick and choose battles that have nothing to do with the gospel, and that leads to unnecessary division, which can often snowball into bigger issues. James 4, 1 through 3 says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Nothing is as great of a destroyer of unity as is selfish ambition. God opposes, God opposes the proud but favors the humble. What is another common aspect of the, those three points? It calls us out for putting ourselves in the center of our own lives. The Lord knows how corrupt we can be when we allow ourselves to be on the throne instead of Jesus. We all remember what Jason said a few weeks ago about Jesus being the center of our lives, right? If Jesus is not the center, we are putting ourselves above Jesus and telling him, I can take it from here. That sure sounds like selfish ambition to me. One of the aspects that has always stood out to me is humility. The second half of verse 3 mentions, in, humil in humility, value others above yourselves. I have often thought and prayed about the concept of humility. What I, have, what I have come to understand about humility is that you have so much peace and faith inside of you that thinking about yourself is not even a thought. Humility also comes from wisdom. You can't be a fool and expect to be humble. There is no unity without humility. Again, Ephesians 4, 3 through 6 says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one, hope, when you're called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, 
one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. I found this other quote. It is when we are in unity that we are able to demonstrate God's glory, that is, be the manifestation of God's presence on earth through our relationships with each other and through continuing Jesus' acts on this earth. John 13, 35 says, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. In John 17, 22 and 23, again, Jesus says, I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that, they may, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. What a beautiful prayer that was. This relationship of being one with another just as Jesus is one with God is a beautiful call for all of us. So again, just to reiterate some points. What is unity? Unity is one body, many parts. The need for all nations, races, and cultures to be bonded by the love and glory of Jesus, being joined by a single accord, which is the gospel and glory of Jesus, and the goal of unity to bring glory to Jesus so that more people can come to know the saving power and glory of Jesus. I love finding quotes. This is so great. I found this when I was simply researched Acts 2 in unity. That's literally what I put in Google. Church unity is the result of a shared spiritual experience in Jesus, who is the truth. Solid bonds of fellowship are forged in a common spiritual journey and experience. How many of us can agree that we are, we are at the start of that? Right now, I'm specifically referring to our church this time. We are currently sharing in the experience that Jesus is taking us all on a new spiritual journey for us and as a unified church. Right now, all we can really do is humble ourselves and allow Jesus to guide us to the next step. Many, if not all of us, do not know what tomorrow, next week, next month, or next year will bring us and for the church. However, what can we have faith in? That Jesus is moving in our midst. We are still learning how to be unified, again, I'm still talking about us, and it may be difficult without someone on earth leading the church, but we know that Jesus is presently learning, leading our church into the next stage. Be encouraged that this church is on the journey towards spiritual unity. I encourage you all that have not been able to join the Zoom calls that we have on Wednesday night to do so. In fact, I say that as something we should all make sure we have the time for. It has been a fantastic time and I can see the bits and pieces of spiritual growth as we all start to connect with each other more and more. I know I have been encouraged and feel closer to everyone here as week after week goes on. We make the commitment to meet with one another. I hope, so, I hope something similar happens even when we return to normalcy. So, what should unity look like today? I'm going to reread Acts 2, 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The same thing can happen to us. Indeed, unity is something every church should pray for and grow in, as it gives itself to the truth of the gospel and the love that comes from the Lord. Truly, growth in unity is the work of God. It is a result of prayer and the fullness of the Spirit. But again, this is what the church is, a people filled with the Spirit, commissioned to love one another and proclaim gospel truth. So again, I ask, what should unity look like today? It looks like a church whose members first and foremost seek and share the gospel of Jesus, who move in humility and grace and do not seek their own ambition. Unity looks like a people who do not hold back from each other. Sometimes the hidden secrets can keep us away from others. Sometimes as we feel sad or generally down about something, our first action usually is to share it with one another. We feel like we have to take care of it on our own. Sometimes that's true, 
But we have to consider that sometimes the answer we seek for, for an end aspect of life that we are struggling with can come from one another. When's the last time you had someone say something to you and it breathed life into you? That it hadn't been so, it had been so long that you didn't realize you had been holding in your breath for days, months, or even years. Hebrews 3.13 says, But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Unity in the church today also means speaking words of life to one another. These words can be simple. It could literally just be someone saying that, Hey, Jesus loves you. It's that simple. Sometimes they can be simple words of affirmation. I know I've dealt with this, but how many of us have felt shame because of a sin we committed while we tell ourselves over and over and over again that Jesus forgives you and loves you, but actually struggle to actually have faith in that fact? That's one reason why we confess our sins to one another. We have been given the ability to speak words of life over one another. Proverbs 16.24 says, Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and healing to the bones. Proverbs 18.4 says, A person's words can be life-giving water. Words of true wisdom are as refreshing as a bubbling brook. On the other hand, words spoken in anger or selfish ambition can hurt us and cause division among us. Listen, I could talk for a very long time about how many Christians struggle with saying words that were not prayed about or even considered before they were said. Most of the time, people just want to talk to hear themselves talk or find validation in being edgy. Hear me out. You can be right and speak the truth about something, but if it was not spoken in love, what does the Bible say? If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. One of the other reasons why we need unity is because it protects us and it protects others. One of the beautiful aspects about the unity within my unit's drill band is that we do not have to think about what someone else may do because we can trust them to perform and do their job correctly. For example, I have to trust the person in front of me to not stop when they are not supposed to and to move when they are supposed to. The person behind me also trusts and expects the same thing of me. We are so close to each other and one wrong move could result in injury. I've before had my mouth smashed inwards with a metal mouthpiece. I can tell you that, that that's not fun at all. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So we all come in the unity of faith and of knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Being in a band, we all have different roles. And what helps us to be unified? Sticking to our roles. As a trumpet player, I would not be able to play the clarinet or a flute. If I was a drummer, I would be completely incapable of playing another instrument because it requires a completely different set of skills. There is nothing in the entire world that can match the unifying power of the gospel. Another beautiful quote I found is this. The gospel unites people from every nation, every race, every language and culture. It unites people that the world cannot and won't unite. Amazingly, the gospel can unite the racist and the racial activists. It can unite the killer and the victim. It can unite the self-righteous and the wanton sinner. And it conjoins the church and the unchurched. Again, this reminds me of Revelation 7, 9. I just want to read it again because I love this passage. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could remember, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. One thing that worries me right now is a common theme I see where people from completely different cultural and or racial backgrounds who come to know Jesus are expected to worship and live the same as the next person. 
that when people say you have been given a transformed mind or your mind has been renewed, it instead implies a cultural transformation instead of a spiritual transformation. Their personality changes, but their heart does not. This happens in an environment where the gospel is not the highest calling. Because of this, you start to see a division between the people who experience a cultural transformation and those who experience the spiritual transformation. I've said it so many times, I'm going to keep saying this. Our highest calling that brings us to unity is the gospel of Jesus. If there's any action you want to take or a word you feel like you have to say, first ask yourself, does this help to advance the message of the gospel? Will this bring unity or division? Remember our highest calling to Jesus and to one another. I want everyone here this morning to be encouraged by the power of unity. I and them and you and me, so they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. I want you all to ask Jesus on your own what your role in bringing unity into this church looks like. For some of you, that may, be, that may mean opening yourselves up more to one another. For others, it may mean the opposite, taking a seat back and allowing others to have the opportunity to speak. For all of us, I believe it is speaking encouraging words and words that bring life to one another. Listen, this church is doing an amazing job in growing in unity. No matter what your specific role in unity may be, we can all start and or continue in praying that our church, our home church, and the church around the world will be brought to unity. I certainly feel encouraged about the future of this church and what Jesus has in store for us. I just want to make sure that we continue this upward trend. Of course, there are lessons to be learned and growing pains to be felt, but that is okay. The Lord has unity for us on his checklist. Jesus, this morning I want to ask you that you reveal anything with Holy Spirit in our hearts that is taking us away from the gospel. First, Jesus, I ask that you deal with the unity between us and you. If there's anything in that connection or anything in that way, I pray that you deal with that first in us, Jesus. And as you slowly deal with the unity between you and I, or quickly, I pray that you also start to increase unity between us and this church. We thank you, Jesus, for where we are right now. We thank you that you have put us on an exciting path of spiritual growth and power that this church has not seen yet. And I thank you that unity is the answer. Jesus, you say that it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, and it's the glory of the king to search it out. We're searching out unity, Jesus, for your glory. And we thank you that you revealed to us the secret things, so you can equip us to do what you want us to do. Amen. Next song is our prayer.
Jesus, bind us together in your love. Again, I pray that you bring us together in unity, Jesus. And if there's anything in the way between us and you and us and each other, I pray through Holy Spirit that you root it out and expose it so that it can be brought before the throne, Jesus. We bring ourselves in humility before you, asking for unity in this church. I pray that you encourage us all to speak encouraging words to one another, breathing life into one another, and just in general, loving each other the way that will bring people into our midst, that will bring people to the power of the gospel so that more may come to know you. Bless us this week, and yeah, just bless us this week, Jesus. Amen. Thank you.